I think we'll use one of those to stop the beeping. Alright, how do I use it? Ah. Heals me to fall. Excellent. Alright, let's take these fools out. I'll have a chat to my team before we rush in. And then I'll take a look at that VR mission. This dog, UG. Most unusual, yes? You buy all that? About it being sentient but having no choice? Well, there is not evidence to prove it. It could be programmed to say this, to weaken your will to fight. It'll take more than a talking robo-pup to phase me. Then again, there is not evidence it is not true. Considering the pace AI is advancing, it is not impossible. Relevance. So, what then? Should I have spared it? Oh, I did not say this. In any case, the mission takes priority above all else. This dog UG tried to stop you and it failed. This can only be a good thing, yes? Didn't you say you'd been here before, Boris? Once, back when it was still Soviet territory. Seems like it'd be a lovely place, if it weren't a war zone. The Pearl of the Black Sea, they called it, back when more Russians lived there. It was very popular resort spot for the USSR. This is before the wall fell, of course. Then Russia and Georgia began to fight over the area. Kicking off the war in the early 90s. Hmm. Georgia was a Soviet Republic. Abkhazia, a semi-autonomous state within it. The Soviets like to stoke ethnic rivalries between the two. And not just there. In all the outlying territories. It kept them easier to control. But with the Russians no longer watching over the two. Duh. The Abkhaz were scared. They knew an independent Georgia would swallow their nation sooner or later. So, they took advantage of a Georgian military coup to declare their own independence in 92. Of course, the new Georgian government was not happy to hear this, and so... The same old story. Hmm. And with Russia supporting the Abkhaz, it was a stalemate. Two years later, the ceasefire meant Abkhazia was finally independent, but not officially. They still are not formally recognized by Georgia, or most of the international community. This region is filled with breakaway states. This is true. There is South Ossetia, also in Georgia. Transnistria in East Moldova, and Nagorno-Karabakh, which broke from Azerbaijan. In any case, even Russia did not officially recognize Abkhazia as independent until 2008. So it was not long ago Sukhumi was a war zone. It has changed dramatically since then. They have been rebuilding steadily, with Russian support, ever since SOP was shut down. Good to hear. But doesn't that leave them wrapped around Russia's little finger? It does. Which is why Dolsayev is calling for a truly independent state. He wants an mm. Abkhazia that takes orders from no one. Not Georgia, not Moscow. Sounds like a worthy cause. Duh. But many Abkhaz are happy with the reconstruction Russian support makes possible. Few of his fellow countrymen were interested in what Dolsayev had to say. At first. And then Desperado showed up. Exactly. They brought the sad ending to this little history lesson. It is no wonder so many people mistrust PMCs, eh? I suppose not. Complicated situation. Real talk, I didn't know that Abkhazia was actually a real place. I've just looked at it on my tablet while that um, cutscene or that codec was playing. And yeah, it's totally a real place along with... What was the other place? Sokhumi. It spells S-U-K here, but on Google Maps that I'm looking at right now, it's S-O-K. I didn't realize it was a real place until now. The more you know. Boris, do we have anything else on Dulzayev? Any more on his background? Mm, very little confirmed intel, but it seems he's a former Chechen insurgent. He claims he was part of the Chechen National Congress when they declared independence in 91. This was just after the famous coup attempt in Moscow in August. Things were not stable. Gorbachev lost his political power. It was Yeltsin who signed the Belovezhia Accords. Right. It created the Commonwealth of Independent States. All republics that made up the USSR became independent. The problem is, Chechnya was never a true republic. It was an autonomous state, but still part of the Russian Republic. Like how Abkhazia was an autonomous state within the Georgian Republic. Duh. The same kind of sad story. 
Russia does not recognize Chechnya as independent. They send troops and the fighting begins. It is said 250,000 Chechens were killed over the two wars that followed. One quarter the entire population. Oof. The Chechens were forced to give in. And the war officially ended. But the rebels kept on fighting. Mm. Insurgents fled into Caucasus Mountains, formed several factions. They waged guerrilla war on Russia ever since. We think Dolceev is the leader of just such a rebel group. Sounds like Russia bears some of the blame for radicalizing him and his men. <laughs> I love my homeland, but she is not perfect. What nation is? Just remember, this could all be smoke. We cannot even confirm Dolceev is truly ethnic Chechen. Say he is, though. What would he be after here in Abkhazia? Mm, some Chechen militants volunteered to fight for the Abkhaz in their war in the early 90s. But when Russia recognized Abkhazia to keep Georgia in check, they also began funding recovery. Which the Dozaev crowd see as a play to gain influence. But wasn't the Chechen recovery funded by Russia? Duh. And many rebels believe this is why their people gave up on independence. Perhaps this is exactly why Dolsayev is here, to alert the people before it can happen again. But if the Abkhaz people are not interested in fighting, his plan could backfire. So in a way, it's Russian policy that brought him here. He thinks he's fighting to make these people free. Whatever his motives, no one elected him and no one gave him a permit for murder. Now that he is allied with Desperado, is too dangerous to ignore. Yep, that much we can all agree on. What was up with that wolf dog, UG? Some pretty freaky shit. <laughs> Hadn't thought too much about it. Really? I keep wondering, why give it intelligence if you're not gonna let it think for itself? Hmm, good question. I mean, I guess it makes sense if it improved combat performance. Now that you mention it, it didn't fight like your typical UG. It felt more like I was facing off against a cyborg. Oh. I guess the added smarts make for a tougher opponent after all. That's not what I mean. It wasn't really tougher than your average UG. More like it was, I don't know, hesitant. It didn't follow through on its attacks either. Guess that's why it was still just a prototype. But then why put it out on the front lines? Who knows? Maybe it was the field test. In any case, Probably not the result they were hoping for. Who's they? Desperado or someone else? One thing I don't understand, Kev. Desperado must be violating all kinds of laws here. Why hasn't the international community gotten involved? Well, from a purely legal standpoint, it's actually not so cut and dry. First, there's the fact that Abkhazia is still not a member of the UN. Only Russia and a few other breakaway states even recognize it as a sovereign nation. In the eyes of most of the international community, Abkhazia is technically still part of Georgia. Which would make this an internal Georgian issue. Guess you can't really call it a coup if the displaced government was never seen as legitimate. Exactly. And even if everyone agrees it was a coup, it can be tough to tell which regime is more legit. Sometimes you'll see the military topple a dictator and establish a provisionary government, for example. Now, if they confirmed atrocities were taking place, the UN could deploy troops, recognize government or not. Yeah, but they learned their lesson in Somalia. Right. Ever since then, they've been a lot more reluctant to get involved in civil wars. I don't recall if Somalia is mentioned in the previous Metal Gear games or not. So what about the US and Russia? What's their take on all this? Well, America was never very friendly with Abkhazia or South Ossetia in the first place. And the Georgian government's a regional ally, so the U.S. really has no cause to intervene. Russia wants the old government back, of course. The regime open to their influence. I doubt they'll opt for any large-scale action. Tensions with Georgia are running high already. But you can bet your ass they won't just sit on the sidelines. Boris has got a lot of connections in the Russian bureaucracy. Ex-military buddies. The Abkhaz are officially our clients. But I'm sure it's Russia that chose us. Maybe foot in the bill, too. They can't use their actual special forces, so they call us instead. That's the beauty of PMCs. We're not bound by the same rules as state-sponsored military. You do that, so some... Other countries would be outraged if the Russians went into places we can go freely. From our side, no state to answer to means we can run things as we see fit. By our own code, no compromises. Then again, there's no one to say our code is what's right. 
True. And opinions on that change from person to person, situation to situation. But you let your moral compass waver at all in this business, and real people pay the price. Money's always a factor, of course, but when it becomes THE factor, that's when you got problems. The Montreux document lays out guidelines for what PMCs can and can't do, but there's no way to enforce it. A lot of people see that as the fatal flaw of the entire industry. After all, that's how we end up with rogue outfits like Desperado. Then again, it's also what leaves Maverick free to go after them. The industry has a bad rep, but it isn't good or bad itself. It's up to the morals of those who work in it. All we can do is what we think is right and try to lead by example. Anyway, sorry, you know how I am about this stuff. I'll get off my soapbox now. Don't apologize. That's exactly why we took this job. Taking Sukumi back is the right thing to do. Agreed. And now, that's all up to you, buddy. We always talk about the Montreux document, but why hasn't anyone made it legally binding? People are trying to, both inside and outside the industry, but it's easier said than done. Even with 17 countries on board, it's still just a set of guidelines. They'd need to negotiate an actual treaty based on that agreement for it to become official. And we both know getting everyone to sign on wouldn't be easy. Yeah. Every government's for regulating PMCs until it restricts how they can use them themselves. Mm -hmm. It gets complicated when you try to put it all in exact legal terms, too. A treaty would need to distinguish a PMC's home nation, the one it's active in, and the one that contracted it. Big boss is rolling in his grave. Itself, which isn't exactly thrilled at the prospect of greater regulation. There's just so many different parties involved, and everyone's got their own motivations. So, yeah, long story short, we're a long way from getting anything legally binding anytime soon. <sighs> Sorry I asked. Me too. Again, this game's being a little bit too real right now. Right. Head for the... <laughs> you know, I almost felt sorry for the little guy. What? That UG? Why? Because it couldn't disobey its orders? Yeah, that, and... I don't know, it didn't seem especially interested in fighting you somehow. Really? But was it really thinking on its own? Maybe it was all just an act. Get me to second-guess myself. You could be right. It's just... It didn't seem like just another UG to me. Maybe it's because I'm such a dog lover. That was no cuddly puppy, Courtney. It was a wolf. And a nasty one at that. No, no, I know. You're right. I didn't mean to sound critical. Whatever it was, it attacked you. You had no other choice. Hmm. Didn't have much freedom myself, did I? Yeah, I love dogs as well, and honestly, that dog needed to go down. <laughs> it was attacking us, and there was nothing remotely... What's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say human, but there was nothing remotely friendly about that, Courtney. Copy that. Later, then? Yeah. You know, our last chat got me thinking about all the problems with PMCs. Oh? You come up with a solution to all our industry's ills, then? Murder all our competitors? Let's just change the acronym. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's your solution? Just change the name and change the reputation, eh? To what? I know you like private security provider, but that'd be PSP. Private military security? PMS? Courtney. Well, the Montreux document uses PMSC, right? Private military and security company. A bit more comprehensive. And a bit more awkward too, I guess. Seems like it never really caught on. Yeah, we only use PMSC on contracts or when we're specifically excluding older style PMCs. I guess once a name sticks, that's it. Old habits are hard to break. Right. Besides, I think we're past the point that a name change would do much for the industry's image. I get your point. Though it did work once before, we don't call them mercenaries anymore, do we? True. Courtney mentioning PMS like that, without even a hint of irony or whatever? No, just no. We're not picking up any EXIF codes here either. They're all unaffiliated. Same as Sam. Makes sense. We're enemies. Desperado's EXIF code won't match ours and vice versa. How much do you know about how EXIF works? Not much. Just that it comes up as a positive match for friendlies and unaffiliated for anyone else. Which could be friendlies or neutrals not broadcasting the same code for some reason. Say a damaged transmitter or signal interference. But 99 times out of 100, 
Yeah, it's an enemy. EXIF is based on the IFF radio system aircraft use. Stands for Expanded Identification Friend or Foe. Too bad it only actively IDs friends and not enemies. But I guess asking troops to broadcast, hey, enemy here, kill me, would be a bit much. Hmm. Telling friends and enemies apart was always a problem in the air. But it's gotten tricky on the ground, too. Especially in the war on terror, with all these PMCs and multinational forces mixing together. The U.S. Army experimented with infrared patches to ID allies. They'd show up in night vision. Never heard of this. Then SOP came along and offered a more efficient method? Right. SOP's gone now, but its ID protocol is still used all over. ID chips and dog tags, transponders required on all vehicles, aircraft, UGs, cyborgs, you name it. But if everyone's using the same basic system, how do armies hide their info from the enemy? Heavy-duty encryption, for one. The chips also use a hybrid cross-spectrum system to transmit the data. Without the proper key, it's hard to pick up the signal in the first place. PMCs typically only share their codes with nations or other PMCs they're working with. What happens if they end up on different sides later? Like in a separate conflict? Just change just the key. generate a new code yep. and encryption key. The point is, EXIF is required on all combat units, but it's pretty easy to hide the signal. And 99 times out of 100, unaffiliated means it's a hostile? Right. Just like with IFF and aircraft. You're a quick study, Courtney. Nice history lesson, Teach. Now, if you're done, I think you have a nation to save. Just a little on-the-job training, Kev. Riding out. What's the bet that the 1 out of 100 is going to screw us up towards the end of the game? Alright. Doctor, you got anything for me? Doc, my fuel cells are sapped out. But I'm still able to function? Function, yes. But no longer able to perform any action that would require a sizable amount of energy. But even when your gauge reads zero, you retain basic movement. You can walk around and swing your sword. Use this time to absorb more electrolytes from your enemies. Recharge your cells as soon as possible. Roger that. Am I actually at zero now? I am. Wow, I'm guessing that's a unique dialogue if we're at zero. And we'll probably get something similar if we're also at low health. Our most fascinating opponent, wouldn't you say? Hmm. What did you make of it, Doc? Well, everything it's had seems feasible enough. It's true all UGs feature high-level AI these days. Given enough time to adapt and learn, a neural AI could certainly become able to comprehend speech. Then, with the right interface, speech and conversation will be possible. But what about it having actual intelligence? John Searle disproved the viability of the Turing test back in 1980. Let's look that in up words, later. Just because something talks like a person doesn't mean it's really thinking. It could just be following some program designed to make it seem as intelligent as possible. I'm impressed. You seem quite knowledgeable in this field. I had a pretty memorable chat with an AI once, about 10 years ago. After that, I did a little reading. Ah, yes, of course. The Patriot AI. I heard of this. Was it actually intelligent or just programmed to pretend? I'm still not sure. I suppose it depends on how one defines intelligence. For example, many term chess playing AIs and such as having sectional intelligence. Some in the field believe that sentience or self consciousness is a necessary part of the definition. When you ask if this UG had intelligence, I suspect this is more your criteria? Yeah, of course. Then you could ask how do you define sentience exactly? And on and on and on. Indeed. These terms can indicate a wide variety of meanings depending on one's understanding. Perhaps it is less important to ask if the AI was intelligent or not than to ask how did the AI operate. And or who sent it. Labels are useful only when they further pursuit of the truth. And that, as you well know, is the goal of all science. Sure, Doc. Thanks. I guess. I think many people would disagree on that last statement of yours, Doctor. Doc, that wolf UG. You think it's possible to repair it? Why do you ask? Just curious. Well, normal brain tissue degrades starting approximately three minutes after the heart stops. With neural AI, however, the spin of the internal electrons is retained even after electric power is cut. Assuming there is no damage to the actual AI hardware itself, Yes, repairs should be possible. Hmm, okay. 
Whatever state it is in, I would certainly appreciate it if you could bring it back with you. I'll see what I can do, but the mission takes priority. Of course, of course. I would never suggest otherwise. But let's just say this thing is what it claimed to be. You think there are other intelligent UGs out there? Because if that's the case, I've got a feeling future missions are only going to get rougher. Indeed. Dozens of UGs chatting away on the field would be enough to drive anyone to distraction. Neural AIs are not von Neumann computers, keep in mind. Structurally, they are closer to human brains. Hardware and software are indivisible. The learning data can't simply be transplanted to other AIs. So it can't be copied or backed up either. Normal UGs must be taught individually. This entails streaming provisional audiovisual and body sensor data until it's ready to be shipped out. This process can be sped up by increasing and improving processing speed. But I have no data on how long it would take to train such an AI how to converse. I couldn't even tell you if there's a training program established for such a thing in the first place. If it is indeed a prototype, it likely learned and honed its skills via the process of trial and error. So it's unique. I cannot say with certainty, but I have not heard of any UG like this before. I would imagine that it was telling the truth when it called itself an experimental prototype. There may be others. Or perhaps it's the only one in existence. Glad we narrowed that down, then. Mm. I've got no idea. My apologies, Raiden. I realize we never concluded our discussion on carbon nanotube muscle fibers. Didn't we? CNT drove major innovations in the field of cybernetics, not to mention unmanned gears. As I'm sure you are aware, Walker-type UGs require numerous linear actuators in order to function. Previously, organic polymers or cultivated muscle cells were used to that purpose. But the advancement of CNT technology allowed for comparable power in a far more compact package. This meant the same size UGs could be equipped with even greater firepower. Take the redesigned Metal Gear Ray, for example. The one that I destroyed? They took all the space the old artificial muscles filled up and stuffed it with weapons. Precisely. Of course, UGs have improved in many ways, all to keep pace with cyborg advancements, you know. After all, the original Metal Gear program was designed to unite infantry and weaponry. Really? As an evolution of this concept, the UG is now in direct competition with the cyborg. And the cyborgs already have an advantage with their maneuverability and smaller size, as you well know. Of course, UGs are not dependent on the skills of a human host. Long story short, watch out for UGs. Well, yes, basically. Cyborgs have matched unmanned gears in many respects, but then UG tech advances every day. Do not underestimate any you might run into. Copy that. I thought the idea of the Metal Gear program was to create some kind of mobile nuclear missile launcher that couldn't be detected. I mean, that was specifically Rex, but, you know, not uniting infantry as such. Doc, all the UG talk got me thinking. Why don't we see more manned gears? Ah, yes, with a pilot. The bipedal tanks and such things, hmm? I must confess I have not followed the field closely as of late, but then who has? Since Metal Gear Ray, all the advances and the funding in mobile artillery has been UGs. So why is that? Well, UGs take many more forms. Aerial drones, threaded tanks, armored transports. And they are perfect for the 3D work. Jobs too dull, too dirty, or too dangerous for men. True Metal Gears with a pilot and nuclear payload were huge and very expensive. Yeah, here we go. They were not practical. It turned out the greater need was for smaller, cheaper units, deployed more easily and in greater numbers. So the field narrowed in on this aspect of gear design, an all-terrain link between infantry and artillery. But even then, the UG models were more popular. In most cases, they simply made more sense. But aren't there situations where you'd want gear-level power, but also a human pilot there to make decisions? UG AI has gotten better. But it's still terrible at handling anything unexpected. Like us. Yeah, but Raiden, this is exactly the role the cyborg has taken. On the manned gear, any advantage of a cyborg in offensive power comes with a matching increase in size. This makes it so large as to no longer be practical for most infantry missions. Conversely, the smaller models are so close to cyborgs that, well, what is the point? Hmm. Cyborgs are smaller, cheaper, more nimble. Precisely. Perhaps soon we will see the cyborg take the place of the UG, 
as the Yuji has done for the Mand Gear. <laughs> what, with wings? Scooting around on wheels? Why do you laugh? It is the logical next step to have a human brain integrated into a oh, tank or a plane. Now you're getting into some B-grade sci-fi territory, Doc. Oh, but it is all quite possible, I assure you. Just consider the possibilities. Let's not. A humanoid frame for everyday life, yes. But the brainstem can be easily extracted and inserted into whatever chassis best suits the mission. <sighs> so, hmm. Yes, I suppose the paradigm could be flipped on its head. As UGs become smaller and smarter, they could begin to fill the cyborg's role. They will come to resemble them more and more in form and function, no doubt. I suppose at some point they would no longer be UGs, but androids. <laughs> Glorious! Can we just accept that UGs and cyborgs both have their roles and leave it at that? One thing about fighting these cyborgs, Doctor. It's strange in a way. Oh? How do you mean? I can slice them to pieces, and with all their pain and emotion suppressed, they don't feel a thing, at least against SOP troops. You never forgot they were real people. But these cyborgs, it starts to feel like I'm taking on unmanned gears, robots, not living, breathing men. Hmm. Intriguing. Tell me, does it help assuage the natural feelings of guilt? Are you a real doctor? There is no reason to avoid this topic. Man has wrestled with it as long as there has been war. Guns were a huge step, of course, as it became easier to take a life, physically and mentally. Then, destroying a tank or airplane, where you no longer had to see your enemy's face as he perished. Eventually, remote-controlled drones further distanced the killer from his victim, much like the video games. I suppose cyborg soldiers could be seen as yet another step in dehumanizing death. Maybe. I do feel like I could forget I'm taking the lives of real people here. Well, under normal circumstances, you wouldn't necessarily be taking their lives, strictly speaking. So, as long as the brain is supplied with oxygen, a cyborg can survive most anything. Even if respiration is Stay disabled, again. an emergency supply of liquid oxygen would remain in the bloodstream. The cyborg would enter a state of hibernation, yes. But so long as the brainstem were retrieved intact, it could be attached to another body and revived. Jesus. Hm. That's how the two Gemini survived. The Gemini? What? Ah, yes, the twin cyborgs from the motor... What? But Desperado cyborgs are different. Physical self-destruction is a fail-safe security measure. In any case, it is unfortunate that Prime Minister Mane was human. Perhaps if he had been a cyborg, he might have survived as well. We'll never know. Besides, a robotic prime minister? I doubt anyone would accept that. Inside or outside the country. Hmm. Yes. I suppose fear always does trump logic when it comes to the general public. Exactly. Oh, I am so uncomfortable. Platinum, I don't know if you're allowed to do that. You cannot play the let's kill the minorities in the first 10 minutes card and then say, no, they're actually okay. They survived. Oh my God. Those two fuckers survived. The dude who had his head sheared off, where it enabled that protection program, they recovered his brainstem and the other one and attached them to new bodies and they survived. Jesus fuck. That's both incredible and absolutely horrifying. Dryden, something I meant to ask in our last chat. Did you consider opting for emotion restraints? I wish I had just now. One might be leery of the procedure, but it is all perfectly reversible, I assure you. You could implement them for a mission and then do away with them as soon as it was over. Just give it to I'll me permanently, expect. please. To be honest, I have a problem with the whole concept. And what is that? Decisions are about more than just logic. Lose your emotions, and you risk not being able to relate to how normal people see right and wrong. Your conscience could end up different, warped, or who knows, maybe gone altogether. Boris agrees. That's why no Maverick cyborgs are allowed to use emotion restraints. An understandable perspective. There is some data to support your belief. 
MRI scans have isolated the brain activity associated with choosing between good and bad, mostly in the dorsolateral prefrontal and central orbitofrontal cortexes, to be precise. But this entire area of the brain is known to process emotion, not logical thought. It would seem to support the idea that emotion indeed plays a role in values-based decisions. Well, there you go. But another argument can be made that it is emotion that sparks human conflict in the first place. All the great wars, all the great atrocities, would they have happened if not for emotional decisions? I'm sure I could find Maybe some not. bullshit reasons to do it. But we can't just ignore the world view of most of the planet. We don't exist in a vacuum here. To most of the world, a PMC operating on its own guidelines would be like a terrorist organization. They'd say we used brute force to impose our strange values on others. And they'd be right. Yes, well, you have a point. Abuse of emotion restraints has become a hot topic. Suppressing fear tends to boost aggression, which has led to cases of excessive violence. True, achieving the right balance is difficult. But on the other hand, it makes it possible to intentionally make people more aggressive. Even a child can become a bomb just waiting to explode. Yes. It is very likely that Desperado is employing just such a technique. What, using children as bombs? Oh god, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable about this whole conversation. Why did I think this would be a good idea for a series? Okay, so after those deep and meaningful conversations, let's go murder some dudes in front of us. And I'll check out Customize and the VR mission once we get to the next checkpoint. Because the next VR mission definitely wants to teach us about uh, sub items. Do I have a civilian ahead? No. Another rocket launcher. I tried to parry that dude, but it didn't work. And that's probably what I have to do. Nope, we can break the shields. This takes forever. Nope, didn't get airborne. Keep pushing the wrong buttons. Gotcha. Oh no. Oh wow. So I got the perfect parry on him, but he managed to um He managed to interrupt my attack as I went to blade mode. Damn. I don't suppose there's anything else of value around here? No. Just casually climb over the barbed wire like that. Ah, uh, we're running. Alright. Running for dear life. Do you have any advice, fellas? Raiden, if you ever get by using augment mode, <laughs> Absolutely not. Raiden. Jesus Christ. I'm not cutting that one out. I don't remember this. Destroy the unmanned gears. We're just talking about those. The hammerhead missiles have an inertia fuse. Get them before they stop and they will not detonate. And if it's too late to run, try blade mode. Similar to the hemp missiles on Ray. The Hellhead will try to keep its distance from you, as much as possible. To damage it, you could ninja run to close the range after it launches missiles. Or, your own anti-air missiles will be effective too. Are there any nearby? I kinda doubt they just leave them lying around for us. Well, you never know with these types, Raiden. They can be careless. And you won't know if you don't look, eh? It's alright, I have three. Sorry buddy, I got nothing right now. Maybe try asking Doctor or Boris. 
Take care of that enemy first, Raiden. Don't panic, Raiden. Keep cool, stay focused. So you definitely had something to say about the geckos earlier, but you've got nothing right now. Hammerheads have a nasty habit of firing all their missiles at once when they are about to go down. UGs have habits? Of course. They run on optical neural AIs. They can learn behavior the same as you or me. And since all units in a UG line are trained in the same way with the same capabilities... They develop similar fighting habits, yes. All right, so what do I do once it starts unloading all those missiles? Ninja run. Use the projectiles as stepping stones to close the distance between you and the hammerhead. Similar to what we did with uh, Metal Gear right at the end there. All right. So not only do we have rocket launcher for our sub items, we've also got stingers around here. Surface to wear homing missiles. Still don't know how to use these things. But the game is very helpfully teaching me. Hold. Okay, so right right oh my almost said right mouse. The right stick is aim. It's firing at me. I don't want to be anywhere near it while it's firing. It's not going to tell me now. Shit. I don't know what button to push to fire. Okay, it's not square and it is not circle. It is not triangle, it is not X. It must be another shoulder. It's not R2. It is R1. Uh, what am I doing? Let's equip that. RPGs. Shit, another one. Oh, wow. Okay. I see a specific point we can hit here. It is destroyed. Was that the same one? It was. I thought it might have been the second one. A bit of a mess because I haven't done the tutorial for sub weapons. I just want to see the checkpoint thing light up at the bottom and then we'll take a look at the VR mission and I also want to customize and purchase some upgrades. not doing that. I might do it one day if I get really bored. You will no doubt come across several different weapons in your missions. Best we went over their basic use. Pick up the rocket launcher in front of you. And let me run behind me first. Unless you know maybe it wants me to destroy these things perhaps. Oh. A container made for transporting pharmaceuticals. The metallic foil lining is designed to help maintain the temperature inside the box, but has the added benefit of shielding its contents from infrared vision, making it a great place to hide from UGs and cyborgs. Yeah, but how do I equip it? I need to see Raiden inside the box immediately. Contents are shielded from infrared vision. I don't think that's how any of this works, but whatever. You can equip any weapons you acquire by selecting them in the sub-weapon screen. Of course, sub-weapons have a limited number of uses, you know. In this tutorial, it has unlimited ammunition, but do not expect this out on the field. You will want to save them for just the right time, I suspect. Like running into a hammerhead. All the sub weapons you come across, you find that each has its own unique properties. Now, use these weapons to reach the goal point. Okay, clearly we are rocket jumping. I 
three rocket launchers, but they're only going to show up as one, and we've got unlimited ammo here. Yeah, R1. I did not see the R1 underneath the right stick. Definitely want to test out the grenade as well. Uh, did the game not say that this will give me unlimited? No, they're unlimited spawns, never mind. So, splash damage, is that a thing? Not really, because this guy hasn't gone down. All right. So it doesn't matter whether I'm holding or not. That initial arc is basically all I've got. And I do love the way that these are respawning, but the grenades are not. And that's a terribly unhelpful game. Okay, so hang on. If these are sub-weapons... There we go. I think all is well with the world. And it's reusable by the looks of it. So myself. But did you see the cardboard box, Doctor? That's all I really care about. Alright, before we go in, let me purchase some health and some fuel cells, I think. I'm not really using the um, the dodge, the exit square. That is not really working for me, so I'll keep it equipped because it's not doing any harm. But what I might do is, can't do anything for the body. We can do stuff for the, um, for the blade. I can upgrade it there. I definitely can't enhance the body. Yeah, there's no square button there. So let's purchase some life and fuel cells. Yeah, that's the only one I can purchase. Might as well do that. And either save it up or I spend on skills. So aerial parry, I haven't needed to use that yet. Special upward thrust. Nimbly lower his body and execute a special foot sweep maneuver. Sweep kick. I might purchase that. And then immediately look to see how to execute that move in the options. The sweep kick. I know about the launches, and that's really the only move that I've learned. How do we perform a sweep kick? That's more complicated than I thought it would be, so down and up and square. Square, triangle, whatever. I know what the symbols mean, I swear. Okay, so the recovery on that isn't as bad as it looks. Like, just doing a swift kick with no other inputs. There is a lot of recovery time there, but if I mash buttons, it recovers much faster. I'll see if I remember to use that or not. I probably won't. But I figure I need to unlock all of this stuff anyway for the trophies, so might as well.
We have another civilian and we've got some aerial units as well. Also, we've got a path over here that we can't go down. A climb up there? No. Uh, how do I keep this civilian alive? I see stairs on the right. I see maybe something. No, we can't go up there. I'm going to load that. I reckon I could take out one of them, but the other one might be too hard. I'm going to see if I can try and keep this guy alive. And I've just realized we have an additional fuel cell up there, and we've also got 110%. Yeah, look at that caution. How do we keep this dude alive? Okay, these things are screwing me up. Hmm. I really want to try and keep this guy alive if I can figure out how, but my only immediate thought is let's launch a rocket in. Speaking of, I don't believe we've... No, I didn't save the fact that we've picked them up, correct? Correct. How do we save this guy? Throwing a grenade or a rocket is out of question, I feel. Well, so these things, are they, do they actually have dudes hanging ass underneath them? No, they're cyborgs with wings. Look at the guy on the left. That's certainly a cyborg with wings. You must aid civilians, Raiden. It is not part of mission. Only other thought would be to sprint up and try and take out the dude on the left from behind, but that is... I don't think that's going to work. I mean, there's presumably five people here who could also kill the civilian if they were that way inclined. Yeah, look at that. They're both opening fire. Um, How do we save this dude? Maybe I can throw a grenade just, you know, very carefully. Oh, it needs to throw it such that the armoured cyborgs die due to the explosion, but the unarmed civilian does not. And I don't think I can make that work, but, you know. Oh man, this arc sucks. This arm... This arc really sucks. Yeah, pretty much as predicted, that did not save the civilian. Wait, is he still alive? That civilian survived. Is that really the strategy? Do I have to throw a grenade at the civilian and the armored dudes? to knock them into combat, and then the armored dudes are going to concentrate on me rather than the civilian? Because if so, that is hilarious. I love the way the caution is actually a thing. I didn't know that until right now. Alright. Go down, fellas. Trying to ninja run to avoid those particular shots. Right. All right. How do we take care of these two? Do I actually have to range them? I think I might. Unless I use like a launcher or something to get up there, like. That.
Are we done? I'm not even sure that counts as a proper encounter. Um, are you okay, sir? I just threw a grenade at you, but are you okay? You, you saved my life. Thank you. I saved your life by throwing a grenade directly at you. Jesus Christ, game. Yeah, so if we don't want to save that civilian, I assume that battle was easier. Like, you can blow up the two aerial dudes first, and then go after the dudes on the ground. There is something on the opposite side there. How do I reach that? From down there and then up there. Electrolyte pack. Immediately restore fuel cells. Okay. Ah, that's another VR mission. I swear I'm not using a guide or anything for these. I'm just finding them as part of my natural gameplay, and I'm not going to be searching for all of them. I mean, if we find all of them, that would be great, but I don't think it's going to happen somehow. Ah, so that's what... Oh. Well, that would have been a lot more useful than the frag grenade that I threw at the civilian, I guess. That disables any UGs and cyborgs in the area. No permanent damage is done. That would have been much more useful to use, I think. Let me just grab the two homing missiles here, because I think I'm going to need those, and then we will proceed on. Yeah, I thought I saw something here. Where was it? There it is. Oh, so if I'm full up on the resource, in this case I've got five here and I just picked up another one, that goes to my BP. So it's not wasted. Good to know. So that's where they're holed up. Some kind of electronic lock on the gate. Most likely it opens only if you have the right ID data stored in your left hand. Perhaps you could find a cyborg with access and, uh, borrow it? You see any cyborgs around here, Doc? Why not double back? Check the vehicle route again. You know, back at the entrance to the old city. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe you can hitch a ride. Most likely platoon commanders carry correct ID data for the gate. Use enhanced mode to figure out who to hit. Cross, this sounds complicated. So I get past the gate and into the hotel. Then what? This road ends at the hotel. Enter and you should be able to reach a hill from the roof. That hotel was used by the nomenclatura, high-ranking Communist Party bureaucrats. All destroyed now, of course, but in Soviet days, full of luxury. Anyway, you should be able to reach a hill from hotel roof. There are more Soviet ruins past that hill. Get through there and you will reach the rear of the refinery. Head for the hotel roof. Got it. Hotel roof, hill, refinery. Boris, any idea where they're getting the money to fund this operation? Assembling this many cyborgs can't come cheap. Not to mention getting them all here. Hmm. There are two questions we have about the money. Is Dolcev paying Desperado out of his own pocket? And if not, then who is? Duh. We do not know size of Dolcev's war chest. Only that he has some funding. Insurgent does not always mean the dirt poor gorilla with the hunting rifle and homemade bomb. Very true. Some rebel groups are very well funded. In Arab oil nations, for instance. Right. They have benefactors who share the same ideology. Mm-hmm. There is also a chance some other party is backing Desperado directly, creating conflict for their own reasons, like the Patriots used to. Many groups stand to profit from wars, yes? Not just PMCs. Arms maker, Contractor, perhaps it is this kind of corporation behind him. The oil interests alone could make billions here. Duh. Already this violence so near the Abkhazia-Sochi pipeline is affecting markets. 
An interruption in the pipeline would shift the balance of power between the world's oil giants. Whether it's Dolsayev's goal or no, many groups stand to gain a lot of money from this mess. Raiden, I have been thinking. What Sundowner said. That's his name again. How peace in Africa was a problem for him. Do you remember? Yeah. Doesn't sound like somebody fighting for an anti Imani faction, does it? The Prime Minister definitely had his detractors. Anyone in that position would. But he listened to them, treated them fairly. There was no real injustice for the opposition to rally around. So the rival factions never got that popular or that well funded. There's no way they could afford all this. Hmm. But it does not make sense for Desperado to be acting alone here either. Even if they trigger full blown war, there is no guarantee they would get the contract. Perhaps this is about natural resources? The last civil war was over precious metals. You think big business hired Desperado to shake things up? Who can say? At least it has not grown into a real civil war. Yet. We need to figure out who's at the root of all this if we're gonna end it. But knowing is only half the battle. It is the other half that will get you killed. Well, no matter what, this mission has a nice side benefit. Putting a dent in Desperado will screw whoever's backing them, too. Mm-hmm. Our focus is to help the Abkhaz people. But if we hurt those responsible for this on the way, well, so be it. Sounds so nonchalant. You'll need to score an ID if you want to get through that gate. Head back to the old town entrance. Hey, Courtney. Have you ever tried Abkhazian cuisine? Uh-uh. Georgian, yes, but I mean, I don't really know much about Abkhazia, so it'd be nice to try it, though, since we're this close and all. Huh. Even you haven't tried it? Now I'm really curious. <laughs> what do you mean, even me? Well, before we head to any new country, you always hit up local spots that serve their cuisine, right? Time and place, you know, Rodden. Little research trips. Oh, come on. Not always. I just think it's interesting to compare local interpretations of ethnic food to the real thing. Plus, it's a great way to get familiar with a big part of any nation's culture. That's all. Okay, okay. But no time for research this time around, huh? Well, like I said, I've had Georgian food before. And most of the Eastern Bloc sees Abkhazia as just another part of Georgia. But yeah, really tasty. They had this incredible cheese bread. Ugh, and the wine. Georgian wine is famous, after all. Though I hear you won't find it in Russia. They say most Abkhazian cuisine is closer to Turkish food than what you'll find in the rest of Georgia. Apparently only their wine resembles what they serve in Georgia. You're losing me, fellas. How are things back at Control, Courtney? Things? Things are fine. Same as usual, I guess. Russia is... you know, Russia. Not that I've left HQ much to see anything, really. No concerns about security? Isn't that a civilian airport you're stationed at? Sochi International, yeah. But we're fine. We have our own cyborg detail on the job. Plus, any trouble and we can just take off. Literally. One of the perks of housing your HQ in a giant transport plane, I guess. Lisa really just about to ask that. wanted to mess up this op, they'd have a much easier time coming after you directly. I'm not so sure. Have you seen this new body in action? <laughs> it's amazing. It's ready for anything. Unless they... Oh, Raiden, yeah. Your body? Ugh, it's so amazing. I'm uncomfortable. Very funny. Yeah, you know what I meant. <laughs> oh, is it getting hot in here? Or is that just your body in action? All right, all right. If you're done, I'm going to get back to the mission. You started this, Raiden. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll stop. Thanks. For a guy with a bod like yours, anytime. Courtney, you can do better than a robot. Just saying. By the way, I picked up something interesting on that tilt rotor back in Africa. Desperado's getaway vehicle? What do you got? I traced its registration. It comes up as a, get this, male transport. A Somali civilian helicopter. Somalia again. <laughs> Not even the right type of aircraft. So the registration is fake. <sighs> well, par for the course for Desperado, I guess. I wonder why they bothered with the tilt rotor in the first place. Why not? They can take off and land without an airstrip virtually anywhere. Hover too. Meanwhile, 
They have the speed and range of a fixed wing plane, or close to it. And they're quiet. You don't get all that BVI noise from the blades like with a normal copter. Aren't they more accident prone, though? They were. Used to call them Widowmakers. The rotor tech is really complex. There have been a lot of mishaps over the years, but each one's helped perfect the design. These days, they're as safe as any other aircraft, helicopter or fixed wing. Most of VTOL's bad rep is left over from the thrust vectoring jets of the past. Ah, no wonder you know all this. Says here you took down a Harrier once. Wait, by yourself? Yes, by myself, but didn't well, have any help. did have a rocket launcher. Wasn't so tough while it was in hover mode. Uh, I bet you're just being modest. Must have been a pretty crazy op you were on. <laughs> you don't know the half of it. Fuck the Harrier on extreme? I don't want to talk about that. The enemy cyborg's ID information is embedded into the memories in their left hand. Most likely that's what the gate is scanning for. Depending on your ID, you would only have clearance for certain gates. Convenient. No more fumbling around with a pocket full of card keys. But you must cut off a left hand before it explodes, or else the ID will be erased. Mm. And then it's back to square one. Hey, Doc. Kev mentioned a lot of the high-ranking military were brain-jacked. Can you give me any more on that? Well, it is not my area of expertise, but I have working knowledge of such matters, yes. Much of it is similar to cybernetics, you know. Makes sense. A cyborg's frame is reading signals directly from the brain. Indeed. Brain jacking employs nanomachines to stop these signals from reaching a normal body. It's our first mission of nanomachines. Substitute their own signals and control the victim. They can govern all motor movement, but not the victim's thoughts. It is not mind control. So the victim is conscious. More like a puppet. The subject will not move on their own. The pilot must send control signals. You can't just implant an idea like a hypnotist. Precisely. You must manipulate them directly. Now, there are several methods for doing this. The pilot can act out the desired behavior and send the resulting electric impulses in real time. For example, the master raises his right hand, the victim does the same. The master says, Arschgeige, and the victim does as well. Yeah, I get the idea, Doc. Another method is to set an AI in control of the victim. Less convincing, but less labor intensive. The AI can access the subject's memory center, at least, to recognize acquaintances and the like. But anyone looks really closely, and the gig is up. Mm hmm Mimicking behavior from surface memories is difficult, you know. Quite difficult. AIs are still very poor at replicating more subtle cues, such as the manner of speaking. As a result, often the victim can barely pass as a human, much less any certain individual. With the current tech, a passing acquaintance might be fooled, but not a close friend. Not for long. Good. The idea of AIs controlling people is bad enough. At least I'll be able to tell if it happens to someone I know. Ta-da. If brain jacking can access someone's memory, can't we basically see everything in their past? Well, that would depend on precisely what you mean by see their past. The brain does not store every single detail the senses take in, you know. It records highlights, further simplified into a highly symbolic form, all to lighten the amount of data. We know how the brain reacts to what it was previously aware of. We can even gauge the emotion provoked. But reproducing memories? No. I've seen little progress in research to this area. But say we directly linked my brain stem with the nanomachines of a brain jacking victim. Let's not. Couldn't I read their memories? There have been attempts at such things, but it is not so simple, you know. The connections between successive memories make up one's identity. If you disturb that, for example, say we remove all memories you have of being yourself and replace them with my own. Yeah. You would feel you were the great Dr. Wilhelm Vogt. You would behave very similar to how I do. However, what if instead you kept your own memories and we added mine to them? You would feel you are both Raiden and Wilhelm Vogt. Suddenly your memories would not lead one to the next. You would be confused, disoriented, without a sense of which man you were, and thus how you should behave. So, you see, the very concept is not practical for most military applications. In trying to read an enemy's mind, you would, in a sense, become that enemy. Hmm. 
You wouldn't know which side you were fighting for. Precisely. Cyborg memories are completely different, of course. A cyborg's visuals are often monitored by outside parties, much as we do with yours. This visual data can, of course, be recorded for later analysis. All with full video and all in the holographic memory in their left hands. So you can just sit back and enjoy the movie? Well, it's not always recorded, mind you. And even then, there's the issue of locating the desired data buried inside all that video. You might need to comb ten days of recordings from ten cyborgs to find a single person or document. That is one hundred days of work. Even replay double speed, fifty days. Can't you automate the search? Of course. You can flag any time a certain face appears or if certain words are said. But the process is not perfect. And it still requires time, you know. Besides which, often one doesn't know what they are searching for until they find it. Mm, but should you ever wise. require a search through your memory, Raiden, I would be happy to assist you. <laughs> yeah, for a modest fee, I'm sure. It doesn't work for Maverick. Wilhelm Voigt, that's his name. I can definitely think of one practical application for the whole memory slash let's insert memories and swap brain stems around and that sort of thing. That would be for interrogating people. If you're trying to get information out of someone, then you could maybe use that to try and get information. I mean, yes, it might permanently damage you in the process, but sometimes that's the price we pay for such information. I have to say, Doc, it's almost scary everything nanomachines are capable of. Take a shot. SOP, brain jacking. Oh, but the cyborg is capable of even more. You think? I do. With nanomachines. Take a shot. You know this name has always bothered me, nanomachine. <laughs> <laughs> they are much more than smaller versions of existing machines. So much more. You cannot just take a motor and make it all teeny tiny, you know? <laughs> a human chromosome is 10 micrometers long, roughly. A nanometer is 100 that length. These devices must be crafted at the molecular level to work at that scale. It is far more to do with molecular biology than mechanical engineering. Okay, Doc. But where are you going with it? It is, however, now possible to create proteins that simulate viral functions. Effectively fooling natural human cells into taking on a wide range of uh, less conventional characteristics. Boosting strength or resilience or even regenerative ability. Not to CNT muscle fiber levels, of course. After all, these molecules and proteins can only make use of the materials at hand. That is to say, the atoms that naturally occur within the human body. I'm not sure I follow. Are you saying cyborg tech is already more advanced than nanomachines? Well, not necessarily. But the potential for future growth seems much greater, does it not? Natural means can only rearrange what is already there. Boost one ability too far and you might take away from another. If the human race is to truly evolve, I believe we must shed this DNA-driven organic flesh and exchange it for something far more functional. Cyborg technology seems better suited to this purpose, at least in terms of military applications. But then, who knows? A revolution in nanotechnology could be occurring even as we speak. Progress rarely takes the form we expect, you know? Such is the great frustration and glory of science. Speaking of frustration, we got this far in the game through all the codex, and then the word nanomachine was mentioned once. And now it's been mentioned five times very quickly, the floodgates have opened. Oh. The nanomachines have made their appearance. Alright. Pushing the wrong buttons again because I've forgotten how to play. So we need to hack these dudes' left hands. I don't want to be anywhere near that. No. Way too late. I don't know what I'm doing. So I definitely need to hack them like that so the fuel cells are full. Then make a parry at exactly the right moments. And that wasn't it. Well done, buddy. I'm sure your mum's very proud of you. Knocked out his left arm, but I don't think that was good enough. 
So I've mentioned using augment mode to search for the right thing, but or the right dude, but I can't see that. Slice that dude clean in half. Up oh, there we go. So we're trying to hack off his left arm or left hand. Like that. Never mind. Slice through the door. Um, I want another go at that. And I do hope it's remembering that I've listened to all of those codecs. So I'm not sure what I'm missing there. So none of these dudes are targets, but Boris saying that we missed them all makes me think that we can do the same for these other dudes here, but I don't see what I'm missing. Attacking. All right, let's parry you. Perfect parry. Perfect parry. There we go. Alright, let's just fight you, quote unquote, normally. It's too early. Oops. Different attack, you mixed it up. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I see I have to actually cast it in the red area. It's not a clean slice of the hand above the wrist or above the... below the elbow, whatever you want to call it. Bravo! Excellent work! Hmm. There was classified data embedded in that hand. It appears that man underwent modification at the Patriot facility, just as you did. I actually have to hack the hand, so basically slicing it in half, and that actually detached it from the body. Uh, Alright, I hope I haven't missed out on the codex, that's all I can say. I might actually quickly go through them right now and just cut it out. Alright, so apparently I missed Kevin earlier because he has something new to say. Hey Kev, that piece of shit who killed in Mani, is he one of those almighty winds? Yeah, goes by Sundowner. It's a folk name for this warm air current in Southern California. He's also, well, not the formal head of Desperado, but pretty much their de facto leader. Let's see. Born in Alabama, family was poor. Hmm, solid student, decent grades, but no money for college, so he joined the army. Says he fought in Panama in 89, then Iraq, Iraq again, Afghanistan. In 2008, he drops out of the service and starts doing merc work for various PMCs. He's an old man. He was active all through the SOP years. Built up quite a reputation. Hmm. Apparently the sundowner handle comes from all the blood he leaves behind. Looks like the sunset. Anyway, an IED put him out of action for a few years. But then, Cyborg Tech brought him out of retirement. The army investigated him for possible war crimes. A few times, looks like. 
Desecrating remains, torturing POWs, some wrongful deaths. No convictions, though. Pretty rosy past, huh? Not that I'm one to talk. Hey, come on, buddy. You know that's not fair. You were just a kid. You didn't know what you were doing. And it's not like they gave you a choice. Shit, Rodden's yeah. past. Thanks, Kev. I don't know if they're going to tackle that in this game or not, but yeah. At the end of MGS2, it's revealed that Raiden has history. Kev, you dig up anything more on Jetstream Sam? Yeah, actually a bit. Still a lot of missing pieces. I'll take what I can. Right. Full name, Samuel Rodriguez. Born in Brazil, so I guess that'd be more like Samuel Rodriguez. Kevin? He's actually not one of the Winds of Destruction. He's not even a Desperado employee. Yeah. Didn't seem like your typical PMC to me. His father ran a Brazilian Kinjutsu dojo. Kinjutsu? That's a school of Japanese swordplay. Mm-hmm. A lot of Japanese immigrated to Brazil way back when. They brought martial arts with them. Those evolved and became their own offshoots. You've heard of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? It's their variation on Judo. Brazilian Kinjutsu is the same kind of thing. A different evolution of the old samurai sword skills. Bit of capoeira and some other stuff mixed in. Anyway, I did some digging. Apparently, the Rodriguez Dojo was a big proponent of the Uradachi style. Uradachi, a.k.a. Setsujinken, the murdering sword. Basically the polar opposite of my sword of justice. Rodriguez Kinjutsu uses kicks, sword butts, even throws. Unpredictable and very deadly. Anyway, this is interesting. Sam's father was killed by one of his pupils. Damn. There were rumors one of the cartels was involved, but it's not clear how or why. And after that, Sam disappears for a while, then comes back, kills the guy who killed his dad, and leaves Brazil. He travels the world for a while, taking odd jobs, bodyguard, cleaner for the mob, etc., etc. Hmm. Made a big name for himself in the criminal underworld, especially in Central and South America. One story has Sam taking out a mafia hit squad, ten men, all with assault rifles, using only his sword. Not unheard of for a cyborg. This was back in the early 2000s. Come on. He did that without enhancements and pre-SOP? That's the story, anyway. And he's a cyborg now, so he could only be stronger. Not to freak you out or anything. Yeah, thanks, I Kev. I told you, Kev. I got a reading on his fighting style from last time. And my body's been upgraded. I'll be fine. Yeah. No. I know you will be. Alright, so that's Sundowner and Sam. What about Mistral? Right. Head for the oil. We get nothing. Alright. So that is Kevin. It's not going to end well for you fellas, just so you know. Once again, pushing the wrong buttons. You done? Six hit combo, damn. Out of range again. I know what I'm trying to do, it's just I'm terrible at it. Oops. There we go. I need more practice. Oh, more dudes. Okay, so if I'm going to blade mode, I need to commit to it, really. Like that. Oh, 
playing on hard, but I clearly do not know what I'm doing. A 10,000 BP. Okay, we are in the hotel, and man, this place has seen better days. Boris, Doctor, do you have anything to say now that I'm in the hotel? Before we go upstairs and run into some... I remember what's there. There's surveillance cameras up there. Hello? 3D photo frame. What the hell? A display that uses stealth camouflage technology to refract light into a 3D image. It will take more than a girly magazine to get the attention of a motion suppressed cyborgs. This should do the trick. Huh. So it's basically the Playboy magazines from MGS4. And so we're going to the top floor there. Can we go up here and around, or do we have to use our ninja run? To get to the plant, first make your way to the hotel roof. I can't believe we used a grenade to rescue that civilian. Uh, how do we get up there? To me, that looks easy. We should just be able to run over here, right? Yes, good.